everybody, my name is Luke Marr and this is Hot Mode. and today on Hot Mode, we are going to be doing a review of the first day of the fall winter 2019 haute couture season. Now there are a few brands we're going to be talking about, some of them are amazing and we love them, and other ones are disgusting and make me want to die. Before we get any further into the video though, if you guys are looking for a channel that talks about fashion in the most fun, sassy, bitchy, analytical way, this is it. You move down below, hit the subscribe button, and turn on my post notifications. I mean, like, what do you have to lose? You're already here. Obviously nothing. And if you guys want to see more from me, you can follow me on Instagram at hotlamode. I post some pretty pop and fashion memes. My Instagram stories are always pretty lit. And if you want to see even more from me, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at hotlamess. I post my outfits and my thoughts. Enjoy. So let's just get right into it. First up, we're going to be talking about Scaparelli. Daniel Roseberry is new to Scaparelli, and his first collection, following the exit of previous Scaparelli mastermind Bertrand Guyon, was a subtle debut. In a recent interview, Roseberry discussed that Scaparelli herself was a master of modern. And I agree. And I also think that subtly for this first collection, that was his main message. I think he was trying to make haute couture modern. And I think in fashion, a lot of the times we discuss that is haute couture modern? Does it make sense to do it? Like why are brands even still doing it? And in certain ways, I think he actually did make it modern. And in other ways, I think that he, you know, flubbed it really fucking hard. But one thing to note is the way that the show was presented. The models did the usual thing where they walk in their crazy creations down the big old runway. Yes, that obviously happens. But what made it so different was the fact that Roseberry sat in the middle of the runway with his headphones on and like a little cute backpack next to him actually sketching out on a desk all of the looks as they came through, which in reality is supposed to mirror the fact that back in December, apparently when he was offered the job, he kind of just sat in his tiny, cramped little New York apartment and sketched. I mean, maybe the 10 years working at Tom Brown rubbed off on him, but it really seemed like Roseberry wanted to tell and show a little story of how he really came to create this first collection. I actually personally thought it was a really, really beautiful way to stage a show. I don't think that it's ever really been done where the designer just sits there throughout the whole collection, but I actually liked it. I thought it was nice to see that there was this magical little story that a designer had no problem being a part of. A lot of designers just sit in the backstage and just, you know, then come out and do their thing where they're like, oh, I'm, I'm an artist. I can't talk. Oh, I can't do yo, No, no. He was like, this is what I do. I'm a fashion designer. I understand that the world is global and that I am a part of this brand. And I think the fact that he could sit in front of an audience while the show was happening is like actually kind of major and magical. But while the show was beautiful, it did not mean the clothes were always landing where they should have. The use of masculine pieces like military coats, simple blazers, and capes were all there. But aside from one really chic little blue crocodile lapel moment, they all felt very, very, very flat. There also was this fixation on this untraditional empire waistline as the cups of the breasts were often accentuated and then almost fixated on whether it was like crocodile skin or like these little glittery boobs. But from there, the dresses always just sort of fell right underneath in a very empire waistline silhouette. I also personally felt like there was too much emphasis on the hair and the makeup and the accessories. And for certain looks, it definitely felt like they were more of the show stoppers rather than the actual clothing being shown. And like that should never be the case, but like especially with couture, like why? I don't understand. And while Scaparelli did love florals, the florals that Roseberry chose were gaudy, banal, and basic at best. It just felt very bleh. And then there were a few of these drape dresses and listen, like I love a good drape moment. I do. But putting like a crocodile bodice under the drape dress. No. Why? I don't understand. Somebody help me get it. I can't. I just can't. Although without, without the crocodile bodice, there was a blue dress that almost felt like it was fighting between the two tones of blue on it. And I really liked that. It was fun, it was interesting. It was something I hadn't really seen before. Finally, there was that rainbow dress. And let me just say that like, we just finished Pride Month. No, 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 fucking no, absolutely not. Disgusting, homophobia, discrimination, 
Stonewall did not fight for that fucking dress to show up on a fucking runway, Daniel. But now let's get on to the good stuff. Well, I did think that the accessories were stealing the show, it didn't mean that they were not good accessories. I mean, between the dead gecko earring and the gigantic snake scarf jewelry bedazzled, you know, viper, I lived. I, yes. I don't know if like jewelry is a big part of Scaparelli. I wouldn't think it is, but like if it is, great. He's doing amazing. If it's not, like somebody starts selling that shit like it was nobody's business. I also really love when Daniel used the bandeau as this is how he separated the gowns into two parts and sort of created that untraditional two-piece empire waistline. And I really loved it. And I feel like it definitely would appeal to a younger customer. There was this one bejeweled bandeau, which was accompanied by this really beautiful black mermaid skirt and also like this big puffy white shawl and i really felt like they were very elegant all paired together whereas it wasn't this elegance that was stuffy and uptight and very old ladyish it felt really young like a girl who loved fashion and would just wear something like that to some really rich fancy fancy thing that i will never be invited to in my life i just thought it was a really really smart way to actually be modern with haute couture i love the ostrich feather look it was fucking spectacular, probably one of my favorite looks of the show. And I also think the fact that the gloves, which not only were like dramatically long and big and very like 1930s, but the fact that they also had their own feathers on them was major, major. And also there was that one beautiful black satin dress with the sleeves that were like an ombre crystallization Mind blown. And we shan't forget the iconic neon green backless wimple. Did you ever think that 13th century women's fashion was gonna be back on top here today at Scaparelli? No, but here we are. I will say the final two looks, meh, could do without. One of them looked like an unused tampon that was fucked up in a manufacturing situation and the, the pink, I'm good. I'm very good, thank you. Overall, for a debut collection, I will say for everything bad, there was something good to combat it. So I'm interested to see where Daniel Roseberry takes Scaparelli. Next up is Iris Van Herpen. Iris Van Herpen is a god, if you didn't know. You've obviously never watched a video on Hot Mode. You have a problem, deal with it. And for this season, fall winter 2019, as one of the I would like to say high priestesses of the cult of IVH. I can confirm to the congregation here at Hot Mode that in fact, our Lord and Savior, Iris Van Herpen, did it again. She did it again. Don't worry, she, she, she killed it. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I wish I could sprinkle holy water on all of you. This season was titled Hypnosis and Iris collaborated with the American artist, Anthony Howe. Howe is described as a kinetic wind sculptor, which I had to Obviously Google, cause I didn't know what the fuck that meant. But essentially he makes these like amazing pinwheel windmill kind of creations that he 3D prints. So obviously Iris Ryan Herpin was like, oh, you also 3D print? Let's creatively have sex and make a beautiful fashion baby. The gigantic moving sculpture at the end of the runway actually set the scene. And then the really beautiful half circle little cocktail dress began the story. The usual netting dresses, which are ones that you can like pull and push apart, like an accordion, created these really beautiful like alien-like shapes. One of them actually seemed like it was eating the model's arms from below the bicep, while also creating this like cape effect, while the other one like fawned and fanned, while each pane of fabric moved while the model walked. Like honestly, the woman is at the point where she is like making window panes out of fabric. Like, where are we? What world are we living in that somebody actually is this creative and smart? We also saw these really beautiful red and white stiff dresses, which was a colorway that Iris actually did play with last season, though we did miss the purple. And then we even got this one beautiful dress that looked like it was printed with the anatomy of some like strange alien creature that you've never seen before, but like you want to get to know. And in a callback to Jordan Roth's Met Gala look, I believe that the dress actually could have had the arms extend so that it pretty much was like when Jordan kind of like flipped it out and it was Jordan 
wearing the outfit that Jordan was wearing. We had a few more of the Birds of Prey gowns, which is a name that I made for this gown, where essentially it's a beautiful sleeveless dress. And then between the shoulder and the hip, there's actually this jutting out of fabric that almost looks like a bird when it's starting to take wing. I've been doing a lot of bird research recently because of this fucking outfit. So I'm very interested in it. I'm calling it the Birds of Prey silhouette. It's the Birds of Prey dress. Iris came back again after last season. She did it again. It was magical. It was beautiful. Thank you. Listen, I'm just trying to be like that lady that called the Dior new look the new look. The colors on the Birds of Prey dresses also happen to resemble last season's colorways with the blues and the purples and the yellows, which is something that I'm very interested with Iris. It often seems like she takes a few, you know, essential criteria from her last collection and sort of bring it to the next one. I can't tell if that's because she has such a big customer base that they want her to continue what she's actually making or she just wants to keep playing with the idea. But either way, I'm very interested in why she does this continuation of pieces. Then we had two more of these like half circular fabric pain as I'm calling them dresses. One was really simple and sleek and very chic and like honestly hot as fuck. The other one was like this over exaggerated hourglass silhouette and like I don't know if she's making a commentary on culture and like body issues and you know what the perfect body is in the 21st century but like I'm just gonna assume that's what she's doing because she's Iris Van Herpen and that's what she does. The pre-finale look which looked like the flutter of a hummingbird's wings sort of looked like they had been frozen in time. But as the model walked, the dress like shook. It was magical. From what I've read, the dress was actually created very specifically for this reason. It was created with like the scientists because Iris Van Herpen loves to collaborate with the scientists always. So they essentially created the structure of the dress so that when it moved, it shook at a pace that was faster than the human eye could recognize. So you can really only see the structure of the actual dress if it's in slow-mo or if it's in a photo. So that's why you're never really able to understand what's actually happening and what the actual little structure of the dress looks like in the little fine details in video. The finale dress was actually created in collaboration with Anthony Howe. I believe it took about four months to create, but essentially it was a very simple little cocktail dress, but it had four different like, I don't even know, wires that looked like this sphere that was covering the model, but it had Ho's like signature little spirally, you know, motor gadget kinetic wind sculpture pieces. So essentially as the model walked, they moved. And it was like, holy shit, this woman's mind, I don't understand. Iris Van Herpen truly is not somebody that I critique. There are looks that I don't necessarily always love, but the thing is, I think if Iris ever gets to the point where I'm like, oh, this looks terrible, you know, I'll let her know. But until that, she's a designer that on her own is always evolving, is never staying stagnant, is always looking to create something brand fucking new. She is somebody that honestly should be talked about in the way that we talk about a Lee McQueen or a John Galliano or a Christian Dior and Yves Saint Laurent. She is amazing, and I don't think that we all recognize that enough. Meeting of the IVH cult adjourned. Thank you for coming. Iris be with you. Finally, let's talk about Dior. Togas, fringes, and flats is all I can really describe this collection as. But listen, it's a Maria Grazia collection. Like, what did you expect? Maria Grazia Curie, or MGC for short, because honestly, I don't like to say the name more than I have to, has released her latest Dior collection, if you can call it that upon the fashion world. I will say that she did keep most of like the kitschy stupidity to a minimum this season, but also like it's Maria Grazia, so it's just gonna slip out sometimes. This season, her less than iconic opening look, which is always a t-shirt slogan tee, and she thinks it like pushes a message, I guess, I don't know, said, are clothes modern? Which was a quote by Donald Rudofsky. It is a very weird question to pose to your audience when you've been working at one of the longest running haute couture houses and your ability to design is called into question at least like three times a day by everybody. And I'm not just talking about like myself and like the other critics on, you know, the internet. 
literally everybody. I mean, listen, are any of the multitude of wool looks modern? Maybe, but I also highly doubt it. I mean, the plunging neckline cocktail dresses, the billowing sleeve jackets, the pulled coats. Why are you pulling a coat so far that it looks like she has an extra fucking hip attached to her body? Like, is that her third leg or is she just excited to see me? Cause I can't even tell. I mean, there's a bar jacket pantsuit and like, listen, the bar jacket is a sacred thing. Why are you denigrating it with a pair of God awful wide leg pants? Or maybe the cape, the singular cape in the collection is so modern, I just might die. Are any of those really truly modern, MGC? I highly doubt it. Would some say that the repulsively oversized bell gowns in blue and red could be modern? Probably not. I truly would like to strangle myself with the fringe looks, but honestly, it seems like the fringe is too short for that to actually physically happen. And listen, there were those really beautiful feather pieces but like also it edges on like Maria Grazia's colonizer couture aesthetic. And so like, I'm just like, God, I can't even like those. There were countless tool monstrosities, but a few of the feather looks were like sort of nice. So I'll, I'll give that to her. Maybe we're at like four looks out of 66 that I can actually say I liked. Although I will thank her for not making it like another hundred plus collection of bullshit that nobody really truly needs to see. She learned how to edit finally if you can call that editing. Then there was this like beautiful black tapestry velvet look, which could have been like a reference back to Yves Saint Laurent, who was like a previous Dior alum, but like, I don't really know. I'm just gonna give her the benefit of the doubt. And then there were all of these gowns that had this like pulling effect. Like they were like pulling the fabric all over the body. I mean, like the colors are shoddy as fuck. And also it looks like the dresses were pulled and then like, fastened with a fucking safety pin. And listen, I could probably do that myself, but also I am not the head of the Haute Couture Atelier in Paris, France. I just don't get it. You have all the opportunity, you have all the money in the world, you have everybody at your back, and that's what you produce. Meanwhile, Kim Jones literally like farts and people are like, Kim, that was beautiful. And the thing is, it was a really beautiful fart. Like he fucking deserves it. Meanwhile, this girl like literally does her absolute damnedest it seems and she can't do shit right. And I mean, it's her own fault. It's just, I feel bad that she's that terrible. Then there was this whole trollop of pieces that were like sewn with lace in them and like had these lace body suits. Why, 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 why? Like it just clogged up already busy looks. And the thing is, it's an all black collection. You literally did 65 looks that were all black. How can you make all black look busy? That's fucking hard. And then finally, for some reason, I don't know why, Maria Grazia sent her finale look down the runway, which was literally this young woman in a fucking box. A box, yes, a box. Was it a box decorated to look like 30 Avenue Montaigne? Founding house of Dior? Yes. But she still sent the girl down the runway in a fucking box. Imagine that you were a model and they say, the casting agency, your, your agent, the casting directors of Dior say, oh my God, you're so amazing. We love you so much. You're gonna be the finale. You're walking the finale. And you as the model are like, oh my God, like Dior Haute Couture, I am fucking walking the finale of Dior Haute Couture. And then you get to the fitting and Maria Grazia hands you a fucking box. It's a box. Listen, is it a highly decorated box? Yeah, great. It's not fucking haute couture, cause guess what? Not even the craziest people I fucking know would wear a box. I don't get it. Listen, it, then they like put her in these fishnets. So not only is she wearing a gold box, now she's wearing these ugly ass black fishnets and she looks like the fucked up sister of that one toy from Toy Story. Except like she's the ugly sister cause she is the box. And the other sister is a sexy sister with the fucking fishing rod hanging out of her. Listen, Maria Grazia, you make my life so difficult. You make everybody's life so difficult. Please like go to Fendi, 
go to anywhere else in LVMH. Go to like Hennessy. Go work at Hennessy. Please go work at Hennessy. That's where you should be. Creative director of Hennessy. Maybe wouldn't fuck up bottle design. Probably would do that too though. And in case you were wondering if Maria Grazia, your clothes are modern. They're not. That is the end of the first day of the Haute Couture review for the fall winter 2019 season. I'd love to hear all of your guys' thoughts. I mean, you know, this is a very polarizing day. You have some people over here and some people over here and you're just kind of in the middle like, mm, 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 this sucks. So yeah, please let me know again what you guys thought in the comments below. I'd love to hear all your thoughts, opinions, comments, concerns, critiques. I will see you guys in the next video and TTYL.